You know, it's interesting to see the emphasis placed on who Jesus is depending on the country that you're in. For example, you know, most of the world, most countries, you know, they focus on Jesus as a baby in a crib at, at Christmas time. That's the, pretty much the, uh, the most common view of Jesus in the world. Um, in Mexico, however, uh, it has its great religious feast with Jesus in a tomb. Uh, in Spain, they have uh, various parades and they carry Jesus around dead on a cross. And there are some uh, festivals there where they actually reenact the crucifixion and some poor soul is pressed into service as the individual. They don't use the big nails on him, you know, but uh, there's actually a piercing of the hands such as the kind of the religious zeal and fervor to reenact the, um, the crucifixion. And then there's just downright confusion at times. I remember seeing an image of uh, um, a department store, I think I mentioned this way back, a department store in uh, Tokyo. And in the window at Christmas time they had Santa Claus crucified on a cross. So they were very confused about the whole idea. Uh, I think a more important question than how is Jesus represented in public hearts is rather who is Jesus to you in your private life? Uh, he can be a variety of things to us and in the story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead here in John 11 we see what he became to each one of these people that witnessed the resurrection. Different things to different people. You know, we know that, don't we? Different people see the same thing. They all have a different takeaway from it. That's what I'm getting at. You know, different people saw the same thing, but they each had a takeaway. Perhaps we can see what Jesus needs to be for us when we understand what He meant to the people who actually knew Him personally, one-on-one -on -one type thing. So the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11, just a little bit of background here, Lazarus, Mary and her sister Martha all knew Jesus personally. Mary was the woman who anointed Jesus with expensive perfume before His death. An act we note that Judas resented, wow, this expensive perfume being wasted, remember that? And then Martha was the woman who uh, fussed you know, with the dinner preparations when Jesus visited their home and she was upset with her sister Mary for not helping her because Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. He was listening to what he said and Martha was you know, busy getting the food ready and everything and she kind of went to Jesus and said, hey, tell my sister to help me. And you remember what Jesus said, hey, I won't, I'm not going to take, she took the best part. She got the best portion. She's sitting here, she's listening. I'm not going to take that away from her. So you see you know, the tug of war between two sisters. How common over something as mundane as, hey, you're not helping me enough. You know, why? why don't you go lay the, the dishes out at least? Do I have to do everything by myself? Pretty normal thing that happens between siblings, right? We know not a lot about Lazarus except that he was a friend of Jesus and that the Lord was very fond of him. We also find out that after he was raised from the dead, he would then became a marked man. You know, he was marked for death by the Jewish leaders. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. So these people, these were ordinary people living in that region during the time of Jesus. But each one of them saw him in a very personal way when confronted with the illness and the death of their brother Lazarus. So how did they see him? Well, first of all, he was their friend. If we read in chapter 11, beginning in verse one, it says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, 
so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So we see in these first few verses of this passage that uh, there was this reciprocal love between Jesus and these individuals. He had been in their home to eat, to visit, to teach, to have fellowship. John goes out of his way to mention that Jesus loved these people. I mean, think of all the people that came in contact with Jesus for a variety of reasons, to be healed, to be taught, you know, whatever. And yet John you know, makes a point of noting, but these people right here, they weren't, they weren't apostles, like Lazarus wasn't an apostle, it doesn't say that these women you know, did anything spectacular, they were friends. He loved these people, they loved him. Jesus was not only a friend, but a friend of weak and sinful people. He loved them not because they were weak and sinful, of course, but despite their human frailty, he cultivated a friendship with them. Well, why do you think that that was so? Well, we believe that Jesus you know, is the Son of God, but we, we believe equally that He is the, he's a man, fully man, fully human. And human beings need interaction. And human beings need friends, not just acquaintances or professional relationships. Human beings need friends. The human Jesus needed friends. And these were his friends. So Jesus you know, is not an unseen spirit or a memory or a symbol. He's a true being capable of friendship with man. Friendship with them, friendship with you and I. And we, we cultivate friendship with Him in the very same way that they cultivated friendship. They, meaning Mary and Martha and Lazarus, the way they cultivated their friendship with Him, we, we do it in exactly the same way. They welcomed Him into their home. Well, we do the same by welcoming Him into our homes, into our hearts, into our lives, through prayer, through obedience, the same welcome they honored him. She and Mary anointed him with oil. We also honor him by not being ashamed of his name, by giving him our best, by offering him our praise and worship. We honor him. And they went to him for help when Lazarus was sick. And we do the same, don't we? By trusting him and going to him with our needs in every area through prayer. I, you know, we, we grow in this area of prayer, and a lot of times we think growing in the area of prayer is simply maybe using longer words, or maybe even sprinkling our prayers with um, uh, biblical you know, passages, good, good. And, and asking for things which are you know, um, really important, world-class importance, but I don't know about you, but I have learned, you know, as I get older, I tend to ask him more for like the smaller things in life. I pray less for world peace and pray more, can you just help me get through with my bad knee for this morning? Can you, can you just help me be a little more patient because I, you know, I've got some responsibilities, you know, the, some kids are coming or, you know, something's happening in my daily routine that I don't normally have a lot of patience for. I, would you help me with that? There's small things. On the golf course, you know, I don't ask him to help me play better. I mean, miracles are done, but <laughs> I do ask him to help me just enjoy the experience. So help me enjoy that. You gave me this, Lord, you've given me this day, you've given me this ability, you've given me these friends that I can enjoy the time with? Could you just give me also the ability to enjoy the moment, whether I play well or not well is not the issue? Let me appreciate the small things that you've given me. Help me not to run over too quickly all the little jewels, all the little gems of kindness that you have given me today. Help, help me see every single one of them so that I can praise you and that I can um, 
experience fully what you have placed in my life today. So this isn't a one-sided friendship. Jesus not only you know, does things for us as a friend, but he demonstrates his true friendship by laying down his life for us, even while we were enemies. You know, that's what Paul talks about in Romans 5, 6, and 8. While, while we were enemies, you know, he died for us. You know, there's never been anybody who wanted to be our friend so much that they were willing to die for us in order to have that privilege. So Jesus is a, a friend. He can be. So he was their friend. He could be our friend as well. He also was their Lord. Skip down to verse 17. It says, um, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been, meaning Lazarus, he had died and so on and so forth. I think we're familiar with the story. So when Jesus finally came, several days after he had been asked to come, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Mary then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into this world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and uh, was coming to him. So the word Lord, notice I emphasized the word Lord there. The word Lord, when it is used of someone, denotes that this person is our master. And then in certain contexts, the word Lord substitutes for the word God. You know, in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus establishes the boundaries of His Lordship, His authority. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, all of it. So there's no greater authority, there's no higher authority than the authority that Jesus has. He is the Lord. They, she wasn't just being polite with Him. He is the Lord of all, whether they accept it or not. Of course, only claiming authority is not proof of authority. Jesus, however, proves His authority with His miracles and His resurrection. He also uses his authority to promise eternal life to all of his disciples. I mean, who but the Lord and God could promise and deliver on such a promise? No one else promises this in any other religion. Martha and Mary both accepted Jesus not only as friend, but also as Lord, and they submitted to him as such. You know, in verse 27 that we read, Martha declares to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. In verse 32, Mary, her sister, she also calls him Lord. And in chapter 12, she anoints him with oil and dries his feet with her hair. Now, a lot of people want Jesus you know, to be their friend. Here's my point, if you're wondering. A lot of people want Jesus to be their friend but they refuse to have them as their Lord. Yes, that's sometimes a problem. They like to celebrate the religious holidays of the baby Jesus or the Jesus in the tomb at Easter and the one that resurrects. They like Jesus to preside at their weddings. They like Jesus to be there at their funerals. They even want Him to be a friend in need when the going gets rough but they don't want to obey Him as their personal Lord and Master. 
They want to be their own Lord and have the Lord Jesus as a friend. You know, like two Lords? He's the Lord and I'm the Lord of me. You know, they want it both ways. But you see, Jesus can only be your friend if He is your Lord. If He's not your Lord, well then Satan is your friend, whether you know it or not. We can't have Jesus only one way. He must be Lord over our hearts and our mouths and our body, our time, our money, our home, our career, everything else in our lives, if we want Him to be our friend. When we see the kind of friend that He is, we want Him to be our Lord. When we experience His Lordship in our lives, we realize that He is by far, by far, the very best friend. So there's Jesus as friend, their friend, Jesus as Lord, their Lord, and also Jesus as Savior. Skip down again, this time to verse 38. And I do this because I, I'm fairly certain that everyone here is familiar with the story of, of Lazarus. Verse 38, it says, so Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. They probably didn't give this aspect of their relationship much thought. But when Lazarus died and lay wrapped in his tomb for four days, this became the most important aspect of their connection with Jesus. You know, wasn't, wasn't it amazing this morning? I don't mean that our dear brother Bud was ill, but did you see how this all kind of unraveled here? Here's a, a, a brother who's, you know, he's not very, very old, but he's, you know, he's got some age, he's got some uh, you know, mileage on the tire, and, and, he, and he, he, he faints. And of course, uh, I didn't realize we had that many people in the medical profession that actually uh, are in this congregation. You know? So I mean, he, he was getting more care than he actually needed there. They were waiting in line to take his pulse. And once they had us, you know, assured that, okay, he's, he's he's come back, you know, it's a fainting spell, something else, and then they helped him away. You know, Marty, there was no weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, Marty, the preacher, one of our elders said, you know, let, let's pray for our brother. Nobody thought, well, I mean, the, the whole day is ruined. We might as well go home. Let's cancel the game. No. Let's have a prayer for our brother. And without you know, no, no uh, ulterior meetings, meanings or anything. He just said, you know what? Let's pray that he will be well and that he'll be back among us because we always pray for life, right? We pray for life. And then without any shame or embarrassment said, but if on the other hand, you know, the Lord has decided this is the day that he is going to take him, then hallelujah. I mean, where else could somebody say that? And the 300 people sitting there go, Amen. And if Bud could have himself, he would have joined the Amen. Only that happens when Jesus is your Savior. <laughs> See what I'm saying? If He's just the guy in the tomb, or you know, if He's just the guy at Christmas, well, you don't have the same impact. But if He's your Savior, you can say amen 
when death comes by closely because you're not afraid of, of death. And so these people here in the story, they didn't give this aspect of their relationship a whole lot of thought except when Lazarus died. In verse 43, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus indeed came back from the dead and was restored to his sisters and his friends. And of course, his great friend and Lord Jesus. This was Jesus' greatest public miracle and it produced several things. First of all, it confirmed beyond any doubt that He was who He claimed to be, the Lord and the Savior of the world. Secondly, it was the act that led to His own death because after witnessing this miracle, the Jewish leaders that were present at that time became determined that the only way to stop him was to put Jesus to death. We've got to stop this guy. We're going to, we're going to find a way to you know, take him out. How ironic that to save themselves and their positions, they began to plot to kill the one who had just demonstrated that he had the power over death. Talk about blindness. <laughs> and it was also an act that prefigured Jesus' own resurrection as well as the potential resurrection of every believer because Lazarus was a believer. And all the other believers that were standing there watching this knowing as Lazarus go, so I go one day. And they're there and they witness the very thing that Jesus has been promising them, resurrection from the dead, and goes ahead and gives them a demonstration of His power to make good on that promise. How marvelous to have Jesus as a friend, as far as Lazarus is concerned, but how marvelous to have Him as your Savior. Now I say prefigure for Lazarus because Lazarus had to suffer again the pain of physical death. His resurrection at this point was only to demonstrate Jesus' power over death. Poor Lazarus. He came back a fantastic witness and so on and so forth, but after this he was already marked for death. He knew he was going to die again. However, he also knew from experience that he was going to resurrect again. The resurrection of Jesus, however, is the proof that one day all believers will resurrect never to die again. You know, there were many saviors throughout history who have made all kinds of promises, but Jesus is the only savior who has demonstrated what he can save us from and that is eternal death and suffering. We have it right here, a demonstration of it. You know, in the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, we see real people who are experiencing a real relationship with a real human being, Jesus. He was their friend, he was their Lord, and in the end, he became their savior. So as I close out my lesson this evening, I think it would be profitable for us spiritually to examine what kind of relationship do we have with Jesus Christ? Who is He for us? Is He a public figure, you know, a famous religious person that we know about? That's usually pretty much what, you know, what the majority of people have with Him. Um, is He the object of our religion? You know, some people have Buddha, some people have Mohammed. We have Jesus. Our church stuff is about Jesus. Is that who He is? Is He a friend for bad times? You know, when we're in trouble, we go to the good Lord. We go to the good Lord above for help. Is that who He is? Is He the owner of our favorite hangout? Some people go to Cheers, you know, the bar. Some hang out at the bowling alley. We have the Church of Christ as our main place to see our friends and socialize. Yeah, yeah, we got to put up with all that religious stuff, but eventually we get to see our buddies. Some people get to see their buddies just a little too much sometimes. 
on Sundays. That's another matter. If Jesus was any one of these for Lazarus, he'd never had come out of the grave and he'd have nothing to look forward to now. Only when Jesus becomes our Lord and our friend will he become our savior. You can't treat him like an object. You can't treat him like just a famous public figure or some kind of genie or a social director and expect him to save your soul. After all, you wouldn't expect any of these kinds of people to die for you, would you? We need to begin treating Jesus as the Lord and the master of our lives. Trusting him like a friend in order to guarantee his role in our lives as savior of our souls. And so I'd encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to make Jesus your Lord and your friend. Of course, the first step in accepting Him as Lord is to repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith in Him, be baptized in His name. And your friendship with Him also begins here and continues as you learn from Him and serve Him. And there may be times when you're separated from Him as your friend and you can renew that friendship through prayer and through forgiveness. You know, sometimes because of your weakness, you may be separated from him as a friend, but you know what? Once he is your savior, he's always your savior, always. So I pray that everyone will experience the surpassing joy of having Jesus as Lord, as friend, and because of this experience, the glorious resurrection that he will produce in all of our lives as Savior, Lord, friend, Savior for all of us. I pray that we will have that kind of relationship with Him from this night forward. If you need, if you need to make any adjustments to your relationship with the Lord, then we offer, as always, a song of encouragement, a moment of reflection, so that if you need to respond in some way, you can come forward for the prayers of the church or to confess Christ, whatever else your needs may be.